Hello everyone and welcome back to Tab's Cottage. Today we'll be reading chapter 26 of the Witch Song of Shannara. Let's begin. After capturing Jer at the fall of the dwarf fortress of Kapow, the Melret Stiths marched him north through the wilderness of the Anar. Following the twists and turns of the Silver River as it wove thread-like through trees and brush, over cliffs and across ravines, they passed deep into the forest land and the darkness that lay close about. All the while they traveled, the veiled man was tapped, was kept gagged and leashed like an animal. Only at meal times was he freed of his bonds so that he might eat, and the cold reptilian eyes of the Melrit were always upon him. Gray rain filled hours, slipped away with agonizing slowness as the march wore on. And all that had been of the Veilman's life, his friends, companions, and his hopes and promises seemed to slip away with them. The woods were dank and fetid, infused by the poison wars of the Silver River, with rot and choked by dying brush and trees, clustered so thickly that the whole of the sky was screened away by their tangle. Only the river gave them any sense of direction as it flowed sluggishly past, blackened and fouled. Others passed north in those days as well, bound for the deep and gnar. On the wide road that ran parallel to the Silver River, which the Melred cautiously avoided, caravans of gnome soldiers and their prisoners trekked in steadily procession, mirrored in mud and laden with the pillage of an invading army. The prisoners were bound and chained, men who had fought as defenders at Kapow. They stumbled past in long lines herded like cattle, dwarves, elves, and border men, haggard beaten and stripped of hope. Jared looked down on them through the trees above the roadway over which they traveled, and there were tears in his eyes. Armies of gnomes from Greymark also traveled the road, southbound in great unruly masses as they hastened to join. Those tribes already advancing into the lands of the dwarf people, thousands came grim and frightening, their hard yellow faces twisted with jeers as they called to the hapless prisoners that marched past them. More wraiths came too, though. No more than a handful, dark and shadowed things that walked alone and were avoided by all. The weather turned worse as the journey wore on. Skies turned black with thunderstorms, and the rain began to fall in steady sheets. Lightning flashed in brilliant streaks and booming pearls of thunder. Rolled the lengths of the sun and land. Autumn's trees drooped and matted with the wet the colored leaves sinking and falling into the mirror, and the ground turned muddied and uncertain. A gray and dismal cast settled down across the forest land, and it seemed as if the skies pressed against the earth to choke its life away. Gerald almost felt as if that night be that might be so as he trudged helplessly through the wilderness brush, pulled on by the leather bindings gripped in the hands of the dark-robed figure before him, Cold and wet sank deep within him. As the hours passed, exhaustion began to take its toll. A fever settled in, and as it did so, his mind began to wander. Flashes of what had brought him to this sorry state mingled with childhood memories and garbled bits of still life that hovered briefly within his sticking mind, his sticking mind and disappeared. Sometimes he was not entirely lucid, and strange, frightening visions would rack him, stealing through his thoughts like thieves. Even when he was free momentarily of the effects of the fever, a dark despair colored his thoughts. There was no hope for him now, it whispered, compiled the fenders that had held her, and all of his friends and companions were gone. Images of them in the moment of their fall flashed in his mind. With the blinding clarity of the lightning that crackled overhead through the canopy of the trees, Gary Jacks pulled deep into the gray waters of the Stillendelen by the Kraken. Foregrown held buried beneath the wall of some rubble, stone rubble brought down by the dark magic of the walkers, slanter running heedlessly down the underground corridors of the fortress before him, never looking back, never seeing. Even Bren, Alain, and Roan appeared at times lost somewhere deep within the Anar. 
Sometimes thoughts of the Candace Hill River would come to him, clear and strangely poignant, filled with the wonder and the mystery of the old man. Remember, they whispered in soft, anxious tones, do not forget what you must do. But he had forgotten, it seemed. Tucked within his tunic, hidden from the prying eyes of the Melrit, were the gifts of magic the old man had bestowed on him. The vision crystal and the leather bag with the silver dust, he had them still and he meant to keep them. But somehow their purpose was strangely unclear, lost in the swell of the fever, hidden in the wanderings of his mind. Finally, when they stopped for the night, the Melrich saw that he was taken with fever and gave him a medicine to drink, mixing the contents of a pouch at his waist with a cup of dark bitter ale. The veiled man tried to refuse to drink, racked with the fever and his own sense of uncertainty, but the Melrich forced it down him. Shortly after, he fell asleep and slept that night untroubled. At dawn, he was given more of the bitter potion. By dusk of the second night, the fever had begun to subside. They slept that night within a cave on a high ridge line overlooking the dark curve of the river, drier and warmer than they had been on previous nights, free of the extreme discomfort that had plagued them in the open forest. It was on this night that Jer again came to speak with his captor. They had finished their meal of ground roots and dried beef and drunk a small measure of bitter ale. Now they sat facing each other in the dark, huddled down within their cloaks against the night's chill. Without the rain fell in a slow, steady drizzle, spattering noisily against trees, stones, and muddied earth. The Melrith had not replaced the gag in the villain's mouth as he had done the past two nights, but had let it loose about his neck. He sat watching Jer, his cold eyes glittering, his reptilian face a vague shadow within the darkness of his cowl. He made no move, nor did he speak. He simply sat and watched as the veiled men crouched across from him. The minutes slipped by, and at last Jer grew determined to engage the creature in conversation. Where are you taking me? He ventured cautiously. Slitted eyes narrowed further, and it was then the veiled men realized that Melrit had been waiting for him to speak. We go into the high bends. Jer shook his head, not understanding. The high bends? Mountains below the raven's horn, Elfling. The other hiss. Stay for a time within those mountains. Put you in the gnome prisons at Dunfree Aren. Jer's throat tightened. Prison? You plan to lock me in a prison? Guests of mine stay there. The other rasped, laughing softly. The veil man stiffened at the sound of the laughter and fought back against the fear that washed through him. Why are you doing this to me? He demanded angrily. What do you want from me? Yes. A hooked finger pointed. Does the elfling truly not know? Does he not see? The cloaked form hunched closer. Then listen, little peoples, here. Ours was the gifted peoples, lords over all the mountains life. Comes to us the dark lord many years gone past now. And a bargain was struck. Little known people sent to serve the dark lord if he leaves our peoples be. Lord still within the mountains. Does this the dark lord and in his time persists, passes from the earth. But we endure, we live. The crooked finger twisted slowly. Then comes the walkers. Climbed from the dark pit of the male moored. Climbed into mountains. Serve the magic of the dark lord, they say. Give we up our homes, they say. Give we up the little peoples that serve us. Bargains mean nothing now. We refuse the walkers, the wraiths. We are strong also. But something done to us. We sicken and die. No young are born. Our peoples fail. Years pass and we weaken to a handful. Still the walkers say we must go from the mountains. At last we are too few. And the walkers drive us forth. He paused then. And the green glit slitted eyes burnt deep into the veiled man's. Filled with rage and bitterness. Left me for dead the walkers. The wraiths. Black things of evil, but I live. 
Jared stared at the monster. Sliffs was admitting to him that the Melrit in the time of Shea Olmsford had sold to the warlock lord the lives of the mountain gnomes so that they might be used to fight against the Southland in the aborted Third War of the Races. The Melrits had done this in order to preserve their lordship over their mountain kingdom in the Ravenshorn. It was as Forger had told him, and as the dwarf people had suspected. But then the Mordraves had come, successors to the power of the dark magic of the warlock lord. The Eastland was to be theirs now, and the raven's horn would no longer belong to the Melrits. When the lizard things had resisted, the wraiths had sickened and destroyed them. So Sliffs had indeed been driven forth from his homeland to be found by the dwarves and brought into Kapow. But what has all this to do with me? He demanded, a sinking suspicion settling through him. Magics, the Melra hissed instantly. Magics, little friend. I wish what you possess. Songs you sing must be mine. You have the magics. You must give them to me. But I can't, Jerry exclaimed in frustration. A grimace twisted the other's scale face. Can't, little peoples. Powers of magics must again come to my peoples, not to the wraiths. Your magic shall be given, Elfling. At the prisons you shall give them, you will see. Jer looked away. It was the same with Stiffs as it had been with the gnome Set Spilk. Both had wanted mastery over something that Jer could not give them. The magic of the wish stone was his and only he could use it. It would be as useless to the Melrit as it had been to Set. And then a chilling thought struck him. Suppose that Stiffs knew that. Suppose that the Melrit knew he could not have the magic, but that he must make use of it through Jer. The Veilman remembered what had been done to him in that cell in Kapow. Now the Melrit had him reveal the magic. He caught his breath. Oh, Shade, suppose Stiffs knew, or suppose that he even suspected that there were other magics. Suppose he sensed the presence of the vision crystal and the silver dust. You can't have them, he whispered almost before he realized what he was saying. There was a hint of desperation in his voice. The Melvish reply was a soft hiss. Prisons will change your mind, little peoples. You will see. Jer Olmsford lay awake for a long time after that, gagged and hobbled once more, lost in the darkness of his thoughts as he listened to the sounds of the rainfall and the breathing of the sleeping Melvish. Shadows lay about the entrance to the little cave. Without the wind blew, the storm clouds above the sun and forest. What was he to do? Behind him lay his quest and his shattered plans for saving Bren. Before him lay the known prisons of Dunfree Aaron. Once locked within their walls, he might never come away again. For it was certain that the Melrit meant to keep him there until it revealed what he knew of the secrets of the elven magic. But he would never give up those secrets. They were his to use in service that came to Silver River in exchange for the life of his sister. He would never give them up. Yet he sensed that despite his resolve and whatever strength he could muster to resist his captor, sooner or later Stiffs would find a way to wrest those secrets from him. Thunder rumbled in the distance somewhere, rolling across the forest land deep and ominous. More ominous still was the despair of the veil man. It was a long time before exhaustion overcame him, and he at last fell asleep. Jer and the Melrit resumed their march north with the coming of dawn on the third day, plodding through rain, mist, and sodden woods. And at midday, they passed into the high bends. The mountains were dark and rugged, a cluster of broken peaks and crags that straddled the Silver River where it washed down out of the high forest land below the raven's horn. The two climbed into their mist, swallowed by mist that clung to the rocks until at last, as the day waned and the night began to fall, they stood upon a bluff overlooking the fortress of Dunphy Aran. Dunphy Aran was a sprawling castle-like complex of walls, towers, watches, and battlements. The whole of the fortress had a gray, dreary cast to it, 
as it materialized out of the rain before them, one that would have been there, Jair sensed, even in the best of weather, wordlessly they trudged from the trees, the tall cloaked Melrit leading the hobbled veilman, and passed through the brush and scrub of the bluff face into the sodden camp. Gnome hunters and retainers of all ranks and standings plodding past them across the muddy grounds, cloaked and hooded against the weather and caught up in their own concerns. No one questioned them. No one gave them a second look. They passed over stone parapets and walkways, over walls and causeways, downstairs and through halls. The night began to deepen and the light to fail. Jared felt as if the world were closing in about him, shutting him away. He could smell the stench of the place, the closed and fatigued reek of cells and human bodies. Lives were expended here without much thought. He sensed with a chill. Lives were locked away within these walls and forgotten. A huge block-like structure loomed before him, windows no more than tiny slits. Through the stones, doors iron-bound and massive. They entered into this building, silence closed about them. Prisons, Elfling. Jer heard the Melbert whisper back at him. They traveled a maze of dark and shadowed corridors halfway, halfways filled with doors whose bolts and hinges showed rust and cobwebs. Undisturbed by the passage of time, Jer felt cold and empty as he watched row after row of these doors pass away. The boots echoed dully in the silence, and only the distant sound of iron clanging and stone being chiseled came otherwise to his ears. Jer's eyes scanned dismally the walls that rose about him. How will I ever get out of here? He wondered in the silence of his mind, how will I ever find my way? Then a torch flared before them in the corridor, and a small cloaked form came into view. It was a gnome, aged and ruined, yellow face ravaged by some nameless disease, so loathsome that Jer pulled back against the leather ties that bound him. Stiffs advanced to where the gnome stood waiting, bent over the ugly little man, and made a few cryptic signs with his fingers. The gnome replied in kind with a brief motion of the crooked hand. He bade them follow. They went deeper into the prisons, the light from the world without all but lost in the twist of stone and mortar. Only the torch showed them the way, burning and smoking through the blackness. They stopped at last before an iron-bound door similar to the hundreds they had passed before it, hands twisting roughly around the metal latch. The gnome wrenched his bolt free. With a grating screech, he brought the heavy portal open. Stiffs looked back at Jared, then pulled at the leash and brought him forward into the room beyond. It was a small, cramped cell, empty save a pile of straw bundled in one corner and a wooden bucket next to the door. A single tiny slit cut into the far wall led through a silver of gray light from without. The mail returned, cut free the bonds that tied Jared's hands, and slipped loose the gag that bound his mouth. Roughly, he shoved the veil and passed him into the bed of straw. This is yours, Elfling, he hissed. Home for little peoples until you tell me of the magics. The crooked finger pointed back to the hunched form of the gnome behind him. Your jailer, Elfling, he is mine, one who still obeys. Mute he is, does not speak or hear. Songs of magics useless on him. Feeds and tends you, he does. He paused. Hurts you, too, if you disobeys. The gnome's ravaged face was turned toward the veil men as Stiff spoke, but revealed nothing of what the mind behind it thought. Jer glanced about bleakly. Tells me what I must know, Elfling. The mower whispered suddenly. Tells me of never. Tells me or never leaves this place. The cold voice hung with a hiss in the silence of the little room as yellow eyes bore deep into the veil man's. Then Stiffs wheeled away and strode back through the cell room door. The gnome jailer turned as well, crooked hands gripping the iron-bound door by its latch bolt and pulling it firmly shut. Huddled alone in the dark, Jared listened until the sound of their footfalls had disappeared. 
The minutes slipped away into hours as he sat motionless within the cell, listening to the silence and thinking of how hopeless his position had become. Smells assailed his nostrils as he sat there, rank and harsh, mingled with the sense of despair that coursed relentlessly through him. He was scared now, so scared that he could barely bring himself to think. The thought had never crossed his mind before in all the time that had passed since he had abandoned his home in Shadyvale, fleeing the gnomes that hunted for him, but now, for the first time, it did. You are going to fail, it whispered. He would have cried then if he could have made himself do so, but somehow the tears would not come. Perhaps he was too frightened even for that. Think about how you will escape this place, he ordered himself. There's always a way out of everything. He took a deep breath to steady himself. What would Garrett Jacks do in this situation, or even Slanter? Slanter always had a way out. Slanter was a survivor. Even Ron Leia would have been able to come up with something. His thoughts drifted for a time, wandering through memories of what had been, sidestepping effortlessly into dreams of what might somehow yet be. All of it was fantasy, false rendering of truths twisted in the madness of his own despair to become what he would have them be. Then at last he made himself rise and walk about his tiny prison, exploring what he could already see was there, touching the damp cold stone and peering at the shaft of gray that slipped through the air hole from the skies without. His journeyed all but the cell. He journeyed all about the cell, studying to no particular purpose, waiting for his emotions to still themselves and his thoughts to settle. Suddenly, he decided to use the vision crystal. If he were to have any sense of what time remained to him, he must discover what had become of Bren. Hurriedly, he brought the crystal and its silver chain out from their place of concealment within his tunic. He stared down at the crystal, cupped gently within his hands. He could hear the old king's voice whispering to him, cautioning him that he would be the means by which he could follow Bryn's progress. All he need do was sing to it. Softly he sang. At first his voice would not come, choked with emotions that swam relentlessly through him still. Yet he hardened himself against his own sense of uncertainty, and the sound of the wish song filled the tiny room. Almost at once, the vision crystal bright and sharp light flaring outward into the gloom and chasing the shadows before him. Before it, he saw at once that it came from a small fire, and Bryn's face was before him, obviously studying the flames of a campfire. Her lovely face was cupped in her hands. Then she looked up and seemed to be searching. There were signs of strain and worry and she looked almost haggard. Then she looked down again and sighed. She shuddered slightly, as if repressing a sob. A sob. All of her that Jer could see seemed to be given over to despair. Whatever had happened to her had obviously been unpleasant. Jer's voice broke as worry for his sister flooded through him, and the image of his sister's frowning face wavered and vanished. The veiled man stared down in stunned silence at the crystal cupped in his hands. Where, he wondered, was Alanin? There had been no sign of him in the crystal. Leaves in the wind, the voice of the camp the Silver River whispered in his mind. She will be lost. Then he closed his hands tightly about the vision crystal and stared sightlessly into the darkness. Oh, wow. That's the end. Of chapter 26, what in the world is he going to do? Did you notice that his and Bren's situation are so similarly terrible? Alanin just died in hers and he's in jail? I wonder how they're going to get out of this. Okay, guys, come back to Tab's Cottage next time for chapter, I believe we're on 26 or 27? Did I just forget the chapter that fast? I sure enough did. Okay, guys, <laughs> bye. <laughs>